coming together was just, it was really fun. And where's Al? And it was intergenerational, wherever you <laughs> We had more grown-ups than kids there with costumes. I mean, it was really fun. I forgot to wear my spider when you were there. But it was just a lot of fun. Thank you, Patty. I really appreciate your time. And don't forget. Uh, this morning we talked uh, at, at our book club, one of the things that we said, we used the word fear. And that we all have fears at one point or another. But today I come and I bring you uh, good news because fear brings a lot of emotions and one of them is sadness. And I want to tell you something this morning. As you comfort yourself, Drop into your space, put your mind, your will, your emotion, your spirit into what's going to happen today. When you, when you make a, 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 a pull on the Holy Spirit, he comes and gives it back to you. So, so let's prepare ourselves to receive what is going to come forward today. So let me read this good news to you uh, from Matthew uh, chapter 5 and verse 4. And this is from the New Century Version. Those who are sad now are happy because God will comfort them. So sadness, whatever you're feeling today, however sadness might be manifesting in your life, be a good cheer because God's got you and you can be happy knowing. And so what have you done? He loves us. He loves you. Have a wonderful service. Dr. Laura. <laughs>
Lewis or Laura Post. We long to be where you are, to stand in your very presence, and to behold you face to face. And so we have come to this place today. We have gathered together to worship you, to offer the praise which belongs to you alone. Bless us as we worship you together, and as we open our hearts and minds to your presence among us. For you alone are God, the one in whom we trust. Earth, 
just like disintegrated. So if, like, he helped me get baptized uh. with that song. And I will forever be grateful. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah. As always, each and every one of you are welcome here. Our doors are open, and you are loved for all of who you are. So no matter what you're feeling, or just not feeling this morning, no matter what you believe, or what you may be doubting, no matter where you have come from, or where you are going, no matter who you love or how you identify, you are welcome here at Glendale United Methodist Church. So I welcome each and every one of you. Give each other a big hug this morning. <laughs> no hands. <laughs>
and everybody else wasn't, and there was going to be me and Steph, and Steph was leaving after 12 hours. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. But luckily, there were a lot of people from Creekwood there, and Steph had introduced me, so I met some Creekwood people. And honestly, the best part of Mountaintop to me was the people. The, it was amazing to me how fast relationships were formed when everybody had the same purpose and the same vision. So when you get there, you have all your meals family style, which really helps to kind of bring everyone together to, to begin with. But then they do, and this is another piece that was intimidating, so they form the teens, the team you're gonna work in all weekend. And it starts to look like a schoolyard pick. Now, oh. being a little chubby kid, schoolyard pick did not go wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was a little also very intimidated by, uh oh, this is gonna be like awful. But it's like, what a schoolyard pick should have been. Like the yeah. best possible way. Yeah. Because it was really awesome, because it was focusing on what people needed for each team. So like each team, they'd be like, okay, we need a driver. Or it looks like we have a lot of males, we need a female. Or we need someone older, we need someone younger. It was really awesome to try to keep the teams as diverse as possible. So my team, what was really awesome about it is we ranged in age from 23 to 80. Nice. And hit pretty much everywhere in between. Nice. We had 30s, 50s, and, or 30s, 40s, and 50s. So we were truly, Intergenerational. <laughs> and we all came from different places. So we had Michigan, we had Florida, um, Ohio. We had everybody represented. And the first day we get to this little micro house um, that had, and our, the woman, the homeowner we were working with, uh, was just the sweetest thing. She had um, wanted to take care of her mom. So she would started to build with a friend this little home on her property so that her mom could come and live with her. However, she then, um, her breast cancer came back. And because of medical bills and things like that, she was unable to continue building this home, which is where Mountaintop stepped in to finish the construction of the home. So that is just the epitome of what Mountaintop does. They focus on four things. So the spiritual, the physical needs, which we were helping with the home. Social, which is just going and speaking with the homeowner and be bringing the people aspect to it. And emotional, I think was the fourth one there. Okay. <laughs> so um, it was just awesome. When we got there, we saw all that needed to be done. And we actually finished our project early. And we became such a good team so quickly. And that was probably what impressed upon me the most. I didn't know these people when I got there. I didn't know anybody. But by the end, I really did feel connected to them, <clears throat> connected to our homeowner. And it's just amazing to me how much we got done because we were all believers and we were all on the same page and we all wanted the same things. So it really was a, such a wonderful experience for me. So definitely consider it um, when it comes up again. It's something that was way more, I think Kelly said it best when I was talking to her about it last week, in that we, I got so much more from it than I gave with my little minimal construction skills. However, I did learn how to use a caulk gun and make it stop. <laughs> very important lesson. And then uh, I learned how to put up a screen. Actually, me and one other woman, we were very proud of ourselves. We screened an entire back porch by ourselves. Wow. So that was awesome. And the homeowner was very impressed and made a point to tell people, oh, well, my porch was put up by two women. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so just continue to keep them in their in your prayers. Um, we want to. I also want to lift up. Um, this is prayer. This was an answered prayer that happened a couple weeks ago, but Laura wasn't here last week. Um, <laughs> so Laura became officially licensed. Is that correct? Um, and this is a prayer request that we've had for a long time because it's been a long process of getting it approved by the state and everything. So that is a huge joy that we share as a church. Um, and then a new joy um, that I'll lift up that kind of Amy Charlton was a part of making happen. Um, but Glendale Elementary uh, apparently has this tradition where the kid, the third grade class all dresses up in costume and they have been walking to the governor's mansion to hear a story read. Um, well, this year the governor's mansion is not doing that. Um, so we have invited them over to Glendale you know, Methodist and so they will be coming here on Halloween in costume. You say Halloween. <laughs> Does that make the governor the Grinch who stole them? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, and then I want to lift up Lynn Kirk, who is here this morning. She is having knee surgery this week, so let's keep her in our prayers as, in our prayers as she goes through that. Are there other joys or concerns you would like to lift up this morning? A joy I have is that one year ago, as of a few days ago, my grandmother had started chemo. She is now completely cancer free and wow. she's thriving wow. at age. would like to say that it is a great joy for us to be a part of a congregation with a pastor like you who is always willing to meet the community wherever they are and um, I'm so grateful to have you and I wanted to celebrate you and you know celebrate Stephen today because I think that is a, a beautiful thing it's a, it's a true gift to us thank you Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, you pour out on us the many blessings that only you can give. This morning we give you thanks for new babies and the joy of fatherhood. We thank you for answering our persistent prayer that Dr. Laura will be officially licensed by the state. We give you thanks for Glendale Elementary and our partnership with them and the ways that we um, can rise to meet the call of our community. We give you thanks for Stephen and all the work that he does as he celebrates his birthday today. We give you thanks for Mary Kate's grandma as she is cancer free. And even as we give our thanks, we remember and pray for those who are still seeking you um, and answers to their prayers. We lift up David's family and Laura and the passing of his father. We lift up Lynn Kirk as she prepares for her surgery this week. Um, we lift up Ashley and her wife and the loss of her grandfather. Um, we know, Lord, that you hear, you hear each and every one of our prayers. 
And we pray for those who have been lifted up this morning um, and those who remain still silently on their hearts. We pray also for everyone around the world who continues to live in hunger and fear and in need. And our hearts cry out for them as we long to see your kingdom come in its fullness. And we pray this morning, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us all, as we are all sinners. And we pray this in the name of the one who saves. Amen. Amen. This morning's scripture text comes from Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told them, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of God for the people of God. So last week, um, Alan actually taught us about prayer um, and sharing with us the story of the persistent widow. Um, and so this, this scripture follows up after that and continues our theme of talking about prayer and its importance. But this parable we heard this morning is a little bit more of a cautionary tale. In this parable, Jesus tells us about these two people who go to pray. This first person is a very religious person, perhaps like some of us here. And the second person, this tax collector, is a sinner. He's someone who would have been known for collecting not just the taxes that were required, but taking more so that he himself could earn money and get rich. He um, was kind of being rich off of the poor. Perhaps we could think of him as what modern day would be like a debt collector um, if there weren't really regulations and debt collectors could take whatever they wanted. So Jesus says to the shock of his listeners then and should be to the shock of us today, that it's this cheating, stealing, and no good person, this tax collector, who goes home justified rather than that very religious person. Doesn't this parable make you just a little bit angry? Maybe it's just me. But when I hear it, I think of myself and I follow this call into ministry. You know, I meet with our prayer team at Glendale twice a month. I serve at Community Care Fellowship. I went to Mountaintop. For dinner. Um, <laughs> yes, okay. Not as good as Ashley over there. <laughs> but yet this guy, this tax collector, is stealing money from people. He's making money off of people in need. Um, he's keeping them in this poverty cycle. And yet this is the person that Jesus says is justified rather than the religious people like me. They say that the gospel message, message should challenge the comfortable, and I think this passage for me is very much that. It's very much a challenge to my way of thinking. This, this passage um, makes us challenge what it means to be righteous. Jesus is speaking to the people who, they, who think themselves are righteous. And the Pharisee in the story clearly repre represents these righteous people. The Greek word for Righteous, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but dikaios, something like that. Um, and this term is a relational term. People are not right, righteous in themselves, but they are righteous when they live in right relationship with God and with one another. So when, we, when the full kingdom of God comes, 
um, and people are righteous, we will all live together um, in relationship and a good relationship with each other and with God. And so the issue that's happening in this parable is that this Pharisee is trying to do good, but he doesn't really care about relationships. So he cannot truly be righteous if he's not able to live in the right relationship, not only with that tax collector, but with God and with everyone else. Um, I've been reading a book, it's an older book, um, but it's called When Helping Hurts. I don't know if any of you have read this, um, but it makes us rethink our idea of what it means to be in mission to the world. And as Christians, and especially as Methodists, um, I think we understand that it's important to go out and help people who are in need. Um, but what this book does is it challenges the ways that we think about how we are helping people. Um, and it challenges, challenges us to think that helping people is not just handing them money, and that sometimes that can do more harm than if we really get to know people and really get to be in relationship with them and understand deeply what their needs actually are. So this Pharisee is hurting his relationship with that tax collector. Um, because he commits what I would say is the sin of comparison. And this is so easy for us to do. It's so natural um, for us to think about how we are in comparison to one another, you know, one another. So we might think that we are better than a person, or perhaps even think that we are not as good as another person. But I don't think that God ever teaches us to live our lives in comparison to other people. When we compare ourselves, it takes away our own responsibility for ourselves. And it causes us to never really be truly who our authentic self is. Um, if God has called you to be one person, that's not, he's not calling you to be um, co compared to another person. He's calling you to be exactly who you are. And I think social media um, is one of the great issues that causes us to compare ourselves to others. Because when we look on Facebook or Instagram, we see people living these lives that oftentimes look better than ours because people are trying to put their best, often false face forward. Um, and oftentimes when we're on there, we put our best pictures up there. We put our fake self forward so that we can seem better than we really are. But God doesn't want us to be better or worse than our neighbor, God wants each of us to be the person that God has called us to be. And ultimately, the Pharisee does not offer his true authentic self to God, because all he's offering is his, his self that he thinks is better than this tax collector who is also there praying. But meanwhile, the tax collector is really, truly offering up his, his authentic, sinful self. He's realizing that what he has done is wrong, and he is crying out to God. Um, and only by doing this, by being honest with God, can he be restored in his relationship with God and with the people around him. So should we fast, pray, and care for the need like this Pharisee does? Well, of course. But if we don't also offer up our true, authentic self, and yes, even our bad, sinful parts, Whatever else we do, do doesn't really matter. That's what Jesus is telling us in this parable. So instead of coming to God with what we have done, we should come only with our humble selves, knowing that we are not yet perfect, and crying out to God um, for mercy and to help us be the true people that God has called each of us to be. There's a story um, that is told of a pilgrim who goes on a journey, um, and he wants to learn how to pray without ceasing. There's a passage in the Bible that tells us that we should pray without ceasing. And so he goes to a monastery to ask the monks, how do I learn to pray without ceasing? And the monks tell him, this is what you need to do. You need to pray this prayer, um, and it's the same prayer that the tax collector has prayed in this passage, is Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the, the monks tell him to go out, and I want you to pray this prayer a hundred times. And so he goes out, and he prays, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, a hundred times. Um, and then he comes back, and he says, I've done this work, I've prayed it a hundred times, but I still am not praying without ceasing. 
what should I do? And so the monk tells him, go back, and I want you to pray this prayer 1,000 times. And so he goes back and he prays, Jesus Christ, <coughs> Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he prays it a 1,000 times. And still, he comes back to the monastery. I still don't feel like I am praying without ceasing. I find myself distracted. Um, I get tired of praying. Um, and so the monk sends him out again and he says, I want you to pray this 6,000 times. Um, and eventually, as the, monk, as the pilgrim continues to pray this prayer, he finds that with every breath inhaled and exhaled, he feels this prayer in his soul. Um, and so it becomes, the prayer becomes a part of him, and he finds that in this way he is able to pray without ceasing. And so this morning, as, as we've been talking about prayer, I want to give you this opportunity. Um, we're not going to pray 6,000 times, um, but I want to give you the opportunity to pray this prayer with me a couple times. Um, so, if you find yourself in a nice, relaxed position, maybe take a couple of big breaths um, and focus on breathing in and breathing out. And as you breathe in, I want you to pray, Jesus Christ, Son of God, and as you exhale, have mercy on me, sinner. And let's do that once more. Breathe in, Jesus Christ, Son of God, and exhale, have mercy on me, a sinner. You can take this prayer with you this morning um, and learn to pray it as the pilgrim did, breathing in and breathing out. And I'll invite Laura to come up and lead us in song. The song we're going to sing this morning is It's Me, It's Me, Oh Lord, um, which I thought was a well-known song, um, but if you don't know it, Laura's going to play it through once first so we can hear it.
Friday night. Um, and I was chatting with one of the officers, and he said, oh, your church is the church with the prayer box out front. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I actually left a prayer in there, um, I think it was in January, for his father who had terminal cancer. Um, so it's just neat to know um, that the ways that our church is reaching out to the community in ways that sometimes, sometimes we don't even see. So let us give thanks to God for our offerings. God, we thank you for the many gifts that you have given to Glendale and the way that you are used, able to use those out in the community to reach out to our neighbors in need. We ask that you would bless each and every gift that we give this morning and that it would be multiplied in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. forgiven, we are all a forgiven people. 
And when we come to this table of the Lord, we come as forgiven people, not as people who are better or worse than anyone else, but people who are all equally welcome at this table. Um, and our equality comes from Jesus' sacrifice for us, not anything that any one of us has done or could do. So we lift up our hearts and give thanks to God who has given us this beautiful gift. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. And we ask, Lord, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And together as the children of God, we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is Christ's body given equally for all of us. And Christ's blood poured out for the whole world. Here at Glendale, as always, our table is open to everyone. Table is set and all are invited to come and receive.
few announcements. Um, I will actually start with a moment of personal privilege. Um, all right. um, so I work at United Methodist Communications, which is the uh, communications and marketing agency of the global uh, denomination of the United Methodist Church. So uh, church is my daily life, not only here at Glendale uh, throughout the week uh, in uh, helping uh keep us going and all that good stuff, um, but um, also to uh, uh, lead our uh, local church services uh, team. And um, I, because I've been given this role, I uh, was given the opportunity four times this week to share a little bit about uh, Glendale. Uh, I got to talk to the uh, Kentucky the communications team from the Kentucky Annual Conference, uh, the strategic marketing team or communications team of the Tennessee Annual Conference, um, what was other uh, new communicators uh, from various annual conferences, which are regional bodies of the United Methodist Church uh, in our structure, um, and also uh, got to go to lunch with my boss and the CEO slash general secretary of uh, United Methodist Communications and. Uh, after being able to share about how Glendale came from a few years ago, 20 people in the pews, where I'm pretty sure we were on that list of like maybe be shut down soon, um, to uh, 50 to 70 on a typical Sunday, which is, I always say I hate to use numbers, but it does show impact um, that we are doing something right here. Um, it was just nice to be able to share that story, and as my team is to help uh, local churches do marketing better um, and communicate their mission better uh, through social media, website, graphic design, all that stuff. Um, it's just um, nice to be able to share the story of this place and, and the difference that we're making. And of course, we, we, we made a decision when there's 20, 20 or so on a typical Sunday. I think Carol says 15 on a bad. <laughs> um, and, um, but we were intentional about not only making some differences like the projector and changing worship to 10 from 11 and, and uh, doing communion every Sunday and just very small things that really probably by themselves didn't make much of a difference, um, but also intentional on being an inclusive, mm -hmm. loving, all are welcome and pushing that message and being intentional not only in word but in action. Um, that is what um, has made the difference here um, in the last few years. Um, I am thankful for all the uh, celebration of me today, but I will say um, I don't do it for the recognition. I do it because this place means so much to me as it does for so many people in the pews, I think. Um, and. Uh, It's a group effort. It's not just me. Uh, people come up to me and say, you have saved Glendale. And I said, no, no, I did not. Uh, God saved Glendale. And um, not only that, but it's a group effort. And um, I'm just thankful that we have every, every person sitting here right now has made the difference to make this place what it is today. So I give thanks for all of you on uh, my birthday. Um, it, it's, it's not about me. It's all about everybody. So um, I'm thankful. So thank you for letting me ramble on there for a second. Anyway, my birthday is today. Tommy Woodruff's birthday is tomorrow. And Jade Wiggins has a birthday on Wednesday. Uh, Crossy has been reaching out about Room in the Inn. So if you would like to help with Room in the Inn, it's where we um, uh, host uh, 12 of our uh, friends that are experiencing homelessness. Um, each month uh, during the winter months starting in November. Um, our biggest need right now is if you are a male, um, we need people to uh, stay the night uh, in uh, November and December and James Poland will come back in in January. So if you are available to spend the night uh, to host our uh, friends, uh, please come and see me. Um, all Saints Sunday is next Sunday, so the uh, blue cards uh, in, that you got uh, coming in, if you have any names that you would like to be remembered next Sunday, uh, we'll get a bell from Creekwood. We don't have handbells, uh, but we'll get one. And uh, we remember by name uh, people who have touched us uh, in, in our uh, lives who have been uh, important um, friends and family. So if you'd like to remember anybody by name, they don't have to be associated with Glendale in any way, just somebody who is important to you, please share their names. Uh, if you didn't fill out the blue card, please feel free to email me and we will remember them next.
next Sunday. Um, Amy has an announcement. So, I'm just so grateful for those of you who were here when David was able to speak about our trip to Tanzania. For those of you who weren't part of that, um, I have the privilege to get to work with um, my dear friend, Reverend Nina Lee Hicks. And I don't know if you in the congregation, those of you that know her, it's, she's amazing. So I've gotten the privilege to work alongside her to empower women right where they are, to be leaders in their own community. And I brought trauma-informed care as part of a conference that we held in Tanzania this year. And Neely brought all the women and the men that were leading the movement for cultural change, which you know is extremely difficult and can, and can be very time-consuming, and it's the right thing. So um, finding people where they are and figuring out a way we can come alongside and hold up a megaphone. So that's what we're doing. Women Arise is ho hosting a gala on November 7th. So David, raise your hand. <laughs> and Matt, raise your hand. They'll have cards to hand out in the back of the front so that you can uh, learn more about it and see if it's something that you want to participate with or something that you want to donate to. If you have any questions about it, come see me. And thank you so much. Uh, last but not least, uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we failed to do anything last year <laughs> <laughs> to admit fault there. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, um, we don't have anything fancy or a bobblehead. I think you already have a done with the bobblehead. <laughs> 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 Uh, Pastor Seth Baldwin. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Um, anyway, um, a lot of part um, from my spiel earlier uh, about growth um, has a lot to do when Steph came on board. We went through a lot of pastoral transition for a couple of years, um, and that I think also had part to do with us decreasing in number. Um, when Steph uh, came on board and she was here regularly. Um, that's when we started to see uh, increase in people coming and just the consistency of having a full-time pastor. So I know that I can speak for most of everybody, if not everybody in the room, and say how thankful we are to have yeah. you as our pastor. as much. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, if you haven't given me your card, uh, feel free to give it to staff after the service. But um, the last couple weeks we've been collecting thank you cards um, for everybody to write a message of how grateful we are for you. So we give thanks thank for you. you. Yes. Any other announcements? Very nice. I think we need to sing happy birthday. No, no. Thank you. 